Good evening, one and all present here. I am Suchira from Science Integral, and I welcome you all for BSV ART Act webinar series, which is associated with ISA. Let me introduce you all to our convener, Dr. Seema Pandey. So Dr. Seema Pandey is the consultant and director of Vanshati Fertility from Azamgarh. She is the librarian of ISSA. She is the president of Azamgarh Ops and Gaini Society. She was national executive committee member of ISSA and ISPAC. She is also the co-author of A to Z of PCOS, everything you wanted to know about PCOS. She is the co-editor of Art and Fertility Enhancing Surgery, Ovulation Induction Simplified, Foxy Handbook of Drugs in Infertility, Foxy Focus Preterm Labor. She's also the reviewer of Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology India. She's also the executive board member of Commonwealth Association for Health and Disability. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Suchira, for kind introduction. Now it's my proud privilege and pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome our guest, chief guest, uh, a dear friend and president ESAR, Dr. Amit Patki. Dr. Amit is president ESAR 2426. He is medical director of Fertility Associates Mumbai and honorary associate professor KJ Sumaya Medical College and Hospital. Dr. Amit is also consultant Khar Hinduja and Surya Hospitals and he is country representative to Aspire from 21 to 23 and governing council member ICOG from 22, 2012 to I, uh, 2012 to 20. No, it is <laughs> 21. And general secretary MSR 2018-21, chair West Zone RCOG 2015-20, President MOGS 2014-15, Dr. Amit has more than 35 publications in national and international journals, 50 book chapters, and he has edited th more than three books. And Dr. Amit has two international patents in her name in infertility and stem cell research, and he is a proud TEDx speaker. I welcome our president, Dr. Amit Patki and would like Dr. Amit to just give his words of wisdom regarding this ART Act webinar series two in association, presented by ISAR in association with Science Integra and BSV. Thank you very much, doc, Dr. Seema, and a very good evening to you all. I'm very happy that Seema has taken the initiative of having the first webinar for ISAR in my tenure. In a, te a tenure and congratulations to you. I would also like to thank Science Integra, TOG and BSV for having uh, been with us. Uh, I wish you all the very best for your sem seminar and it is such an important topic that I'm also going to be listening to all the speakers. So without much ado, I would like you all to proceed ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I was muted. So uh, I would also like to invite our another guest of honor, Dr. Asha Baxi, our secretary, ESAR. She is member of executive committee member AIC, <clears throat> CCRCOG West Zone, founder chairperson MP IAG and MP ESAR. Uh, 
member of advisory committee PCPNDT Indore. She's uh, Dr. Asha has got a lot of awards and recognitions to her credit. First, and she also has to her credit the first ICSI, TCXC, micro TCXC babies of MP. Dr. Asha is recipient of Dr. Komut Tamaskar Award Foxy 2008-2009 and Best Paper in Foxy Journal 2011-2012. Dr. Asha has also got Dr. Padmashri Dr. S.K. Mukherjee Award 2021, Excellence Award Danik Bhaskar 2021, and she has organized various conferences like Star Endogine 2019, ICCON 2017, ESAT 2016, and Joint Organizing Secretary of IFFS 2016. Dr. Asha was organizing chairperson AICOG 2022 Indore and organizing chair person New Age OG, OGCon 2023 Indore. I welcome Dr. Asha. Um, to this webinar and we would love to hear a few words from her. Thank you, ma'am. Also, I would like to take a privilege to introduce Mr. Alok Khetri, who is the CEO of BESV. He is the Chief Operating Officer of India Business, seasoned sales professional and a versatile leader with diverse leadership experience of over three decades, serving the industry as a growth catalyst and is recognized for his agility to adapt business models in response to market demands. He has managed multi-country and multicultural global regional teams in pharmaceutical, biotechnology industry with P&L responsibility for India, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Prior to BSV, Mr. Alok has held leadership position in esteemed pharmaceutical organizations such as Cadilla and Sanofi. He was a president in Cadilla Pharmaceuticals India and was head established products business unit multi-country organization in Sanofi. Over to you, Mr. Alok. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Suchita, for the introduction. And thanks to Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Patki, Dr. Asha Bakshi, Dr. Seema, because I think it's a real pleasure for us to collaborate at that time, in, at this time with ISAR for this very, very important topic. In fact, uh, as, as BSV, we are committed to the cause of women's health. And today we are one of the leading companies and one of the leading companies in women health and one of the leading companies in biotechnology. So this is something which is very also close to us that how we can really contribute, especially in this market of assisted reproductive technology. Recently, when the act came, uh, there's a lot of work which our team has done to see how we can support various fertility centers, you know, through some of the external companies, etc., where we can help them with regards to the implementation of the act and also the compliance to the various regulations which have come. So this is our endeavor. Today's topic, especially on Assisted Reproductive Technology Act in India, is very critical. Topic is very important as it addresses the ethical, legal and social dimension of assisted reproductive procedures. And it impacts countless lives. As we know that in the recent years, the number of you know, cases, especially in fertility, infertility, I would say they are increasing. And I think this is the time when we have to really work together with medical, medical fraternity as a company to see what more we can do in this particular segment. Nuances of the act impact not only the fertility clinics, but also on uh, other HCPs, as well as the, you know, the aspiring parents. And at this juncture, we would really want to hear your views so that we can understand which are the areas where we all can work together and really add value. So that is why your insights are going to be very useful because day in and day out, you're dealing with the patients on one side and keeping the act and the provisions, et cetera, on the other. And I think once we are also clear that, okay, these are the areas where we can add value based on our discussions today, we will take those further. 
So thank you very much uh, to everyone. And I'm very sure that this will be very interesting and insightful conversation, which we will have during this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alok. Suchira. Now, I would like, I'm really glad and I feel proud introducing my childhood friend, Dr. Anupma Futela. She's a graduate of KGMC Lucknow. Masters from MAMSI, New Delhi, and she has done fellowship in reproductive medicine from NUH, Singapore. Dr. Anupma is owner and senior consultant at Futela Hospital, Rudrapur, and she has gifted first IVF babies to Kumau region. Dr. Anupma is Dr. Anupma is primary member of State Surrogacy Board. She has been awarded with Best Gynecologist in Uttarakhand Award by Chief Minister in 2022. And she is a regular par participant as a faculty and expert in various national conferences. Dr. Anupma has contributed multiple chapters in Fo Foxy publication, like one in Foxy publication, Handbook of Drugs and Infertility. She is founder and present president Rudrapur Ops and Gyni Society Society, past Vice President IMA Rudrapur. And Dr. Anupma is Executive Member of National Foxy Endometriosis Committee, Executive Member of Uttarakhand Society of Ops and Gynec. She conducts regular hands-on workshops and conferences, and she is a co-founder of NGO at Uttarakhand Board. I welcome Dr. Anupma Futela. Uh, she is going to talk about uh, and her uh, topic, IUI. Can you just show me the topic exactly, please? Suchira. It is related to the ART Act application in level one clinic, a SWOT analysis. I welcome Dr. Anupma. Over to you, Dr. Anupma. Thank you, uh, Seema, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I need to share my screen again. And it is okay, it is showing the option now. Thank you so much. And uh, especially a bigger thank you to give me this opportunity to present on the very first. Uh, seminar on your um, ISAR uh, new tenure as an al librarian. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Patki and uh, Dr. Seema for the uh, beginning of this new ISAR sessions and all the very best. And we are uh, looking up to both of you in this trying era of uh, ART specialists. Uh, we know we have very good leaders with us. Okay, so... That's my presentation. And um, I'm going a brief, giving a brief review uh, of ART laws uh, as far as level one clinics are concerned. So I'm not uh, giving the details of uh, anything about level two because I've been asked to limit my talk of, uh, for IUIs and it should be more of a general gynecologist uh, the talk should be restricted for the uh, benefit of the general gynecologist. So here my talk is basically related to that. Uh, am I clearly audible? Seema, can you endorse it? Yes, I know you are. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. Okay, so SWOT means uh, the strength, the weakness, the opportunities and the threat which are related to the new laws and the new laws which have come up in the ART field. We just want to know a little brief about that. Earlier, they were just ICMR guidelines and they were not any rules or laws till uh, uh, 2022. And uh, uh, in 2005, the ICMR guidelines were created, which we all were following. 
Later on, the bill was formed in 2010, then later in 14 and 17, but nothing actually became as a rule. So all those things which were being discussed, we were all puzzled what it is. But finally, in December 21, the bill was passed, the act was formed, and it was published on uh, again in December. And finally, it was notified and commenced in January 22. From January 22, we are all supposed to follow what the rules are saying. And uh, the common gynecologist, I was also doing the same at uh, one point of time when I was ignorant about the rules that I was doing IUIs. And what I was maintaining was the only thing which I was maintaining was the anonymity. And now many things have changed. It is no longer anonymous a thing which is important rather it is the confidentiality which is important you can at this point uh, at one point of time we could not insert the semen sample from a known donor now we can do that but it is important that it has to be routed through the art bank and not take the sample prepare and put it in so this is uh, slightly different now. So small, small things which I think is benefit of uh, all of us. I'll just enumerate them. Uh, later on, the rules came over. There is a little confusion uh, that in March and May 22, the rules were saying something else. And later on in uh, June, the rules said something else. So we should understand that whatever is there in the gazetted which was in the June 22 uh, form, that is the correct one and not what was published in March and May 22. So do not follow them. They are not the real rules. So do not get confused. And some uh, improvements, uh, improvisations came over later on. And I'm just enumerating them very fast, which are mainly for IVF and not for IUIs. Uh, that whatever follicles are there, all formed follicles can be retrieved. It is not limit, you do not have to limit it to seven. The notary is allowed. It is not metropolitan magistrate, which is required for all of them. The transfer of the gametes uh, can be done by following certain uh, forms. And it has go to go through the national registry. A separate set of forms have come over for that. So that was the February 23 notification. Later on, it was clarified that for surrogacy, a lot of confusion was going on that for surrogacy, donor gametes could be used, but no, the surrogacy can be done only and only with self gametes of male and female, both partners. So that was clearly reinserted uh, in the March notification last year. And later on, the uh, andrologist guidelines were improvised and it was not only MCH urologist, it could be FNB reproductive medicine, as well as the general surgeons who have experience of doing TISA can do the andrology services. Now there are no, earlier it was level one, two, three clinics. Now there is nothing like that. No IVF clinic, no IUI clinic, nothing. It is only two type of ART clinics and one is level one and one is level two. The other thing is ART bank. So these three things have been specified by the new rules. Okay, so now this new law, but since it has come, one problem which we all are facing is that lots of written job has increased. Lots of forms have come over. They were earlier specified in ICMR too, but now... Uh, every second or third month, we keep getting a letter from the uh, state authorities that this form is to be filled, this data is to be given, how many you did, uh, successful cases you did. So all that clerical work has increased for all of us. So uh, that we have to comply. So that data management, since it was uh, not very well done earlier, so it is taking a toll on us that we have to have extra hands to do that. But then gradually, these things will make our few things better. You know, our uh, data compilation with time would get better. And probably we, the gynecologists, were the one who were the soft uh, targets, I can say, that uh, CEA, you, I, I hope you understand that uh, Clinical Establishment Act has not yet been implemented properly. But this act has been implemented properly because, you know, the homework was done by PCPNDT Act. So th those people have 
made this system that PCP NDT has made us friendly to upload uh, our reports, to uh, do things online. So all these things have made and opened up a path. And gradually now these ART services will open path for many more future things which would be more streamlined. So we are one of those, um, what should I say, the path leaders that uh, we are doing, the gynecologist and the ART specialist. So problems gradually which we are facing are ironed out. As an appropriate authority, I keep getting questions sometimes that whether this is allowed or not, whether that is allowed or not. So uh, there are few answers which we can offer. There are few answers which we still do not know. And gradually with passing time, maybe uh, things will get better and better. So uh, the one advantage is that on the World Forum, now we can actually claim, since the transparency is becoming more and more, we can actually tell our good uh, results. Earlier, our things were uh, actually looked upon, whether the data is correct or not, whatever numbers we are giving are correct or not. But now with increased transparency, uh, the world is actually there to see what good work is being done in India. So uh, that's the good part of uh, this uh, uh, extra clerical work which we are doing. Of course, there is one thing which we over the time learned that government sympathy is not with us. Maybe India is bursting with uh, bursting to seams probably with population. So uh, sympathy with ART specialists is not very high. Uh, and CA could not be implemented earlier because of resistance. And we just could not say anything much because law did not, uh, the, the government uh, agencies were not very sympathetic towards us, but oh, it's okay. Uh, with time, uh, I think we are that uh, path leaders. That is what is going to uh, give some um, relief of thought. Now, uh, uh, first clinical situation. Earlier, you, we used to get the semen preparation done from the neighborhood pathologist. So can we do it now? So the answer is very simple. No, we cannot do because the ART Act has now said that the it is the violation of the uh, Act if we do semen sample outside the premises of the level one or level two clinic. So it is very clear that the pathologist cannot do it. The person who is supposed to do it has to be a gynecologist. The gynecologist do, do not have to have any extra training for uh, this extra certification course for this. You just have to learn. It's a very easy procedure. Learn it from your uh, colleagues and do it yourself. This is a thing of future and the people who are who were doing it earlier and now not doing it for the fear of it need not be uh, very wary of it. I understand that earlier, you know, the clinics who will have three to four, the average of three to four IUIs a month they are the ones who are not actually registering. People who are doing 10, 15, 20 IUIs, they have all got them registered. But overall, if you see the data in the national registry, the level two clinics have applied more and level one's clinic applications have been very less. Whereas many gynecologists are doing, but they have they, there is a fear actually of unnecessary clerical work and things like that. But if you're doing it, get yourself registered a uh, one time uh, every five years you have to pay 50,000 fee for that but then you are doing it fearlessly comfortably so uh, my friendly suggestion is that if you are doing it get yourself registered or else refer to a center who is uh, either level one or level two registered for an IUI do not do it yourself or get it done by a pathologist uh, the equipments required are very few. You just have to apply online. You do not have to route it through a tout or any uh, person who would charge you. It's very, very simple. Go on to the website. We all have applied and uh, most of us have got our registrations done. Till date, not a single application government has uh, rejected. So this is the website, artsurrogacy.gov.in and apply on it. The three requirements are in your setup are only three. That is a centrifuge, a refrigerator, and a microscope. So that's a very simple way to go about. And uh, this is the time when all the gynecologists who are doing IUI should be registered and all the clinics 
in which in whose setup the IUI is being done, those clinics are also to be registered. Any postgraduate can perform IUI and there is no restriction to the number of these centers one gynecologist can attach to and there is no restriction to the number of gynecologists on one center. So in my center, I have three, four gynecologists uh, associated with me. So that is not a problem. The name should be there and then that person can come and do the IUI at your place. Uh, the All the gynecologists now should be aware that you have to fill certain forms. I'll just enumerate them later on. And uh, all the masses and doctors need to be aware about the new rules. The pathologist cannot register as level one. We cannot advertise uh, something like home inseminations or I've heard that online home insemination kits are available. Well, it is punishable. It's some If sometime it comes into the notice of any authorities, it is a punishable offense. Beware of the third party reproduction now because in future, probably since one donor and one uh, person is the norm now, so you cannot do the sharing. So in future, it is or you cannot uh, name the wrong donor attached to. So the future paternity litigations and all can come over. So this is a very important thing to understand that uh, you cannot forge documents now. And all the documents should have Aadhaar numbers. The Aadhaar number should have last four digits and rest of them as cross, 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 star, star, star and last four digits. That is how it is written on the documents. Uh, what we should not do is that pathology labs are washing the semen. Uh, what we should not do is that the level one or level two clinic A is collecting the sample. It is sending it to another level two clinic for washing and then it is coming back to level uh, the uh, clinic number A, that is also not acceptable. Even if the two clinics are separately registered, but one clinic cannot send its sample outside to another clinic. So that in between the clinic transportation of the gametes is one thing which could not be done. And uh, one clinic is stimulating the patient and is doing pickup at the other clinic to which they are attached, this is ambiguous. And ultimately it is the responsibility of the second level two clinic. And they are the ones who are reporting the case to the national registry uh, portal. And uh, gamete sharing, embryo sharing, obviously we all know is not allowed. Repeat transfers if the age limit has crossed. Now the time, now at this time, the ART procedure, be it IUI, be it IVF, it is only allowed between a female of 21 to 50. So if a female has come over with an age more than 50 or uh, a male who has come with the age more of more than 55, we cannot do it. If an 18 years old female has come to you, again, you cannot do it. It is very important, 21 to 50 and 21 to uh, 55, that is to be remembered. Consents, uh, taking on mail or on phone, we should try and avoid it because the proper consent forms which formats have come over, we should try and stick to them only. How many times the donations can be done? It is only and only once one person can donate. Of course, if a semen donor is giving a, a sample to one person and that, uh, say supposing that pregnancy has not occurred, then only uh, he can donate again, otherwise not. And sperm donation is only for one commissioning couple, can give any number of times. Therefore, uh, ART Bank needs to keep a tab and take the feedback from the clinic, whether the pregnancy has happened with that uh, sample or not. If the patient is not pregnant, then uh, that sample can still go to another couple. At one point of time, I think just three years back, we could take 10, 25 samples also uh, from one person, but now we cannot do that. So one clinical situation is this, that you have asked for a donor sample, a semen sample from a bank and you got three vials, say supposing, two vials or three vials from that bank and you did the IUI for the patient and the patient got pregnant. So now what do we do? If the patient is pregnant, one vial is used and one is left over. Can we use it to another sample, uh, another couple? No, we cannot. We can use it if that first couple has not got pregnant. 
the pregnancy has not occurred, then that sample can be used. But otherwise, in the uh, one pregnancy has happened with one sample, now we cannot use it for any other patient. Uh, if, say, supposing the pregnancy has not occurred, and then can we use this sample? We, we can use this for another patient, but then for the first patient, we will have to book another donor and not the same donor. Uh, at earlier, you know, I remember I used to get the samples between 1,000, 1,500 or something per semen sample. But nowadays, uh, after testing and everything, the semen sample is usually 10 to 12,000 rupees. And I get usually two vials or three vials. So if I'm not getting that, it is very important uh, for this costly sample that we should inform the bank that we are using the second sample or not, what happened to the first sample, what happened to the second sample. So this is uh, the liability of the level one or level two clinic to inform the bank. Now, one of our colleagues has referred the case for IUI from a non-registered center. Can they do that? Yes, a referral can be done, but uh, they cannot do an IUI themselves. Of course, if it's your friend and they want to do an IUI at your center, get them registered at your center. Get their names <laughs> sorry, at, uh, entered at your place and registered at your place. Then they can do IUI at your center. So I have a female who is 37 years old and the male is 56 years old and their son committed suicide. They had come for, uh, they were trying for pregnancy for a year, but did not get pregnant. So at the age of 37, she came over. So can I do her IVF now? Since they've been trying and she did not get pregnant. No, we cannot do her uh, IVF because the male's age is 56, which is 55 plus. So I could not do it. So then they said, okay, if you're not able to do IVF, that, that's an ART service. So at least do an IUI. So can I do an IUI? No, we cannot do an IUI also because even that is an ART service. So handling of the gametes outside the body is not to be done after the age limit. Now, the new opportunities after these laws are that counseling has become a very important part. And we were doing the counseling. I'm not saying that we are not doing the counseling, but now... Uh, with the counseling and with the consent and with telling them that it's not a very flurry and a very foolproof result that you are getting. We always tell our patients that you are getting an IUI done. There is 15 to 18% chance of you getting pregnant. If you are doing an IVF, there is 60% chance that you will get pregnant. It is not a 100% chance and nothing foolproof is there. So that counseling, even if you are doing to your patient, now you are documenting everything. It is written everywhere in standard consents. And now your patient cannot blame you if the pregnancy has not happened. So that is an advantage that everything is documented. It is more organized sector. And that is why we can consider it as a, actually as a double-edged sword. So uh, the penalties al are also there, but also it protects us with the these disclaimers. So huh, one more thing, that discharge summary is mandatory now. We cannot just write it down that IVF has been done, IUI has been done. What did you do exactly? What was the preparation and prepared sample? How did it go? Just give them in written to the patients. Similarly, how many eggs have you retrieved? Whatever ART services you've done, you have to give that in written. What dose? Earlier, we used to just keep guessing what gonadotrophins were given by another clinic. How do I go about in the second clinic? Now the patient will have the uh, record. So you can always compare and work accordingly. So that's an advantage to the patient. So more transparency and uh, data registry creation is giving that benefit to the patient as well as to our society in general. Of course, the proper infrastructure is taking a toll on our pockets. The extra human resources are required. Uh, legal safety is there, definitely. Uh, even if it, there are penalties, there are protections too. Can we keep the frozen sample at level one or level two ART clinics? For husband, yes, we can keep that sample, 
we can store it also. Say, supposing the husband is going out of country for three months and uh, in between you want to do an IUI for the uh, wife, uh, you can easily do it after storing that sample. But make sure that you are not going to sell that sample or trade that sample or import those gametes to another lab or something. That's a punishable offense. So can a uh, non-registered center or a level one uh, center use the gonadotrophins? This ambiguity is still there. Ovulation induction, of course, you can do. Definitely you can do. But gonadotrophins is still, uh, the RTIs have still not given a proper answer. As an appropriate authority, when it was asked by me, what I will answer, I will say that gonadotrophins are allowed. Definitely, uh, usually a center which is not doing IUIs, uh, would not very easily be prescribing gonadotropins. We all trained gynecologists are scared of OHSs. We all, it's a very important question or, of our uh, MD, MS exams that um, OHSs, one question will definitely come and there is no one who's unaware about OHSs. And we all know that uh, gonadotropins, if it is unmonitored, it can lead to that complication. And so none of us will be just prescribing it for the heck of it. And so whosoever is prescribing, usually that would be a level one or level two clinic. And they are trained for uh, uh, understanding that uh, how things go about. So why not? You should be allowed to uh, use gonadotrophins if required. If overall oral ovulogens are not uh, um, enough, then uh, why not go about it? So a non-registered center which is not level one or level two, probably they should restrict themselves to the oral ovulogens only. And uh, good co cold chain, of course, is to be maintained. Ideally, uh, the scanning should be done by a level two centers rather than a sonologist because sometimes uh, a level one clinic uh, would be just asking about dominant follicle. And uh, the eye for early OHSS changes should be there. And if you're just monitoring the dominant follicle and not mentioning the other smaller ones, the patient can land up in OHSs. So ideally a good uh, level two center or that uh, the person who knows to do those scans should be the ones doing it. And uh, then only then should gonadotrophins be used. Advertisement is big no-no now, about especially about home selections and uh, giving ads about uh, home uh, insemination kits and it all, that is not allowed. Now, this is an important slide. If somebody wants to take a picture, can take it. That uh, what are the various forms? The forms which are relevant to IUI services, I've mentioned them here. First is the form one, which is just an application for getting yourself registered for a uh, level one clinic uh, or level two clinic. Then the form three is when you are registered, then the government gives you this uh, 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 registry uh, registration certificate. And form seven is then the when the husband's IUI sam husband sample is being used for uh, IUI. And form eight is when the donor sample is being used for IUI. Uh, form 10 and 11 are used when the freezing of the gametes. Say, supposing the husband is leaving his sample to be used after three months or two months or uh, he is going out of station. So then that sample can be frozen, but after filling the of the form 10. Form 11 is basically for minors and that is not for the use of uh, a common gynecologist. And uh, form 5 is... Uh, important. Okay, form 14 is a record which we keep and we provided it in duplicate to the bank also, which tells about the donor samples final result. So that is to be kept. kept. Form 5 is something new, which all of us should know. And all the registered centers should maintain this form 5, which is just nothing but a, 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 a template of complaint form. So complaint handling section should be there, the grievance section that forms will be, uh, it should be displayed on your reception or whatever front desk is there and uh, write it down that uh, if your grievance is not being uh, catered to, then you have to, you can contact on so-and-so number. So just write one or two numbers over there and make a team of two or three me members from your hospital. Maybe the hospital in charge or one another person, senior person can become the grievance cell moderator. 
and uh, because usually whenever your center will be inspected for registration they will make sure that they will have a check whether the grievance cell has been made or not so ensure that you make a grievance cell there so another question which comes is that there is a couple coming from another country and they want uh, their iui now can we do it so if there is a foreigner couple or a single patient who's attempting for self cycle uh, wanting for iui no problem you can do it if they are wanting a donor cycle so then donor cycle of course you can do that for donor cycle as well but uh, you have to ensure that the donor is routed through the art bank itself and from the art bank whatever donor you'll get you'll get a aadhar number for that donor so you cannot get a donor from out of the country that uh, without an aadhar number because that cannot be routed to the art bank so that is uh, one catch there patient self eggs no problem donor iui again no problem any person who's nri is having uh, a person who is having medical visa you can go ahead uh, nris PIOs, OCIs, overseas citizens of India, all them, all of them do not require any medical visa. You can go ahead and do uh, NR, uh, the uh, IUI or ART services. In my area, I get a lot of patients from Canada and Australia. We have a lot of Sardar population, Sikh population at our place, and uh, there are long, long queues at Australia and Canada. Like for most of them who come over at play, our places are having. Three to four years waiting there, and the poor ovarian reserve people are actually poor, and we feel very poor for them, <laughs> and uh, they are the ones who are throwing back. And uh, India, India is actually a uh, not just a tourist hub for them; it is their medical need now. So, government would be benefiting a lot by all this uh, ART services. all over the world people are going to come in future with our better data we can actually flaunt our good results now so uh, another um, the donor cannot be another thing is that the donor cannot be nri and it has to be routed through the art bank uh, so in a foreign couple you can do it of course all the tests have to be done like uh, hepatitis b c vdrl and hiv etc can a single woman say supposing you get a patient who's uh, 22 years old and she wants to get a donor iu evidence she is very clear that she is not going to get married this this is something this has actually happened with one of our colleagues whom i know that there is was a young girl who came over that i am not going to get married and i am very clear and i want a baby of my own and since it's allowed now the art services i want to get a donor iu evidence so can she get it done she can get it done but the catch in that patient was that she was uh she was probably less than 21 at that time when she came over so if she is more than 21 of course she can get it done of course it's our part of counseling that we should persuade her to have her a normal married life but you get all sorts of patient and i am sure all of us are facing this chunk of patient whom you just cannot get across so uh, for oocyte freezing this is something very very valid and patients will come more and more numbers with more carrier oriented females all of us are uh, seeing them more and more uh, often and the ladies are coming at later and later ages for pregnancy so if they are aware and they want their oocyte freezing done it's very very good for the society and we just have to remember that the form 10 is to be filled and in that form 10 when you are freezing there is a section which mentions that uh, wife and husband so in that you just strike down uh, wife and for husband just write down not applicable and go about it so this is another thing which is the change that earlier it was anonymity now it is just confidentiality so uh, the question which is asked is that can the brother be a donor yes the brother can be a donor uh, we have to maintain confidentiality the uh, uh, message should not leak from the uh, 
uh, ART clinic who has been the donor. But uh, the couple, if they are knowing who is their donor is, it is okay. We do not have any objections now. Um, in West, people used to use their own donors. They used to get their donors. And the same thing has been probably copy pasted here. But level one, since they do not have the storage facilities, the cryo cans and etc. So just ensure that it's a donor sample. Uh, then that sample has to be routed through the RD bank. That is the only thing which one has to remember. Husband is azuspermic and willing for donor IUI. Mom, mother-in-law comes and requests that my second son will give the sample. Can we use the sample? Yes, we can. Uh, that is what the question was. And uh, it should go through the ART bank. And uh, after the required quarantine period, that sample would be released. But there is another situation where the female has no eggs there and the husband uh, the husband's sample is okay. So the mother requests that her son's sample should be used in some other female, uh, the bhabi in the family. Can that be done? No, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. Absolutely no. Uh, this was a slide which if the time permits, then I will just, this is not related to IUI, but just a fast run over that any married couple who's trying for more than one uh, year can be a commissioning couple. A Hindu male who has come over with a second wife will not be acceptable because it is not legal unless the first wife has been divorced according to Hindu Marriage Act. Even Muslim couples marriage certificate is required for whosoever wife he is getting. Single men cannot take any treatment except semen freezing. Unmarried female above 21 can avail ART's services provided she is an Indian. So you cannot do that for a foreign female, foreigner female. I mean, NRI you can do, but uh, some other country resident, you cannot do ART services for a single woman. For a couple, yes, you can do it. Any female more than 21 can take ART treatment till 50 years of age and a never married woman cannot take surrogacy. For surrogacy, it has to be either a widow or a divorcee and the age is between 35 to 45 for those, those females, single females. Only married couple can use surrogacy. Mm, uh, widow and divorcee can get surrogacy done, but with their self-gametes and not with the donor gamete. So can a living couple or LGBTQ plus uh, apply as an intending couple? No, because they're not married according to the Indian laws. And that's it. There is one more clinical situation. A 38 years old female is married for six months and has having regular periods. This is a very common situation. I, this is probably my last to last slide. And all gynecologists should who, ha, who are not registered and not doing a very active uh, infertility service should uh, probably connect with this situation and understand what what correct or wrong thing are they doing there is a 38 years old female so her age is dwindling she's just at the borderline uh, that has been who has been married recently six months and she's having regular period so suppose we are expecting that not much problem is there now she's come to uh, uh, come for conception to a trained gynecologist but she has not been registered what will she do she will probably get her TVS done. She'll get her thyroid uh, levels done, prolactin done, AMH done. Husband semen analysis will be done. Preferably the semen analysis should be done from a good uh, clinic who are trained into seeing uh, the semen samples. So uh, in such a situation, she has been trying for six months. You should always have a low threshold of referring this patient because she is not having enough time if you are registered, fine, go ahead, go for IUI, the next step required, IVF, if required, then go ahead. But in this patient, many a times we are wasting their times uh, trying for normal conception and you are making her go towards 40 years. And then in that patient, she will probably be needing donor services, which is becoming more and more difficult nowadays. So it is very, very important to understand that in these borderline patients, 
try to be as fast as possible in your uh, infertility management it is mandatory if whatever treatment you are doing if you are doing a, you are registered you are doing iui or you are doing ivf make sure that you are issuing a discharge proper certificate stating all the details whatever has been done and uh, that's it so the 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 strength weakness opportunity threats the, this was my topic so the strengths and opportunities are the good things are that with clear rules the india is expected to be the world leader very soon in art field with better documentation we can show our better results which were thought fictitious we need not have to have any anonymous sample known donors can be used all samples can be tested with uh, for common communicable diseases the semen wash sample shall not be running now in the same lab conditions where the stool samples were being run and the urine samples were being run it would be a proper dedicated centrifuge for these semen samples which is uh, a a good thing to do for the patients the justice now there is new thing which has come up is post humus collection can also be done which was not do being done earlier but the new rules have allowed it of course uh, you have to write a proper consent before your death so a young man dying on a street who is not aware that he should have uh, given a consent for post humus collection would not uh, be of benefit so probably now the whole society everyone every young boy or girl who who uh, would be wanting their uh, samples uh, to be used in future should get their samples frozen that should be the norm in general in the society now with advancements and uh, if the sam uh, the boy is a minor then the parents consent would be enough illegal players the anti social practices would probably be doubt and the better governance would be there and uh, the thing which i feel is that penalties which are mentioned in the rules are only for the the practitioners the uh, level 1 level 2 clinic directors but it should be if the problem is there it should be for the intending couples to it it should be for the embryologist to why penalties is only for them the quarantine clause probably should be removed because the results this has not been addressed and the results of the frozen thaw semen samples are not as good as the fresh samples are when you are doing the blood transfusions with the fresh samples so why not uh, doing this uh, semen sample also this is one thing which probably in future we can fight about and um, cost issues are uh, really big for the small setups the new gynecologist which is coming up uh, with not so deeper pockets you know they are actually having a big problem with the extra cost of clerical jobs registrations every five year re registrations that is something not very good and uh, you know most of the patients are very comfortable with their neighborhood doctors so that neighborhood doctor even if they want to be uh, give a service at a larger scale cannot give it now because they have to be registered so that is one deterrent uh, fear of excess paperwork and red tapeism you know pcp entity also has not given up a very good background people have been punished unnecessarily harassed unnecessarily so that fear factor is all there with the gynecologist so that is uh, to be erased with passing time and that is the onus of the uh, state authorities no sharing or mixing of these samples in our society has really increased the cost which is a strong deterrent for the average indian population and third party availability has become a big uh, problem with that so that's it i think thank you so much for from team futela and uh, seema thank you again thank you dr patki uh, thank you the whole isr team for allowing me to be here with you thank you thank um, thank you dr anupma for your very detailed and insightful presentation i am sure that viewers are going to get benefited by it yes Uh, uh, Suchira, 
Are we ready with Dr. Yeah. So our next speaker is Dr. Nitish Mordia. He is an expert member, National Assisted Reproduction and Surrogacy Board. He, amongst many awards, he awards he has won. One of the prestigious one is budding embryologist of the year national goal by ET Health. Yeah, ET Health of the year. World National Fertility Awards in 2019, leading team of 160 plus embryologists setting educational program for national and international candidates, implementing accreditation programs and striving for clinical excellence. Dr. Nitish Mordia holds a strong background in management and SOP driven systems, design training for Indira Fertility Academy, which have trained over 350 embryology and andrology candidates candidates till now. His special interest in artificial intelligence, new technology innovation, quality management systems and digitalization in the IVF lab. Dr. Nitish has brought an exceptional technological advancement in Indira IVF with help of electronic witnessing, automated alarm and cloud monitoring systems and QMS dashboards. Now we are going to hear Dr. Nitish Mordia's talk. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the ISAR uh, organization, organizing committee. Oh, you are here, great. <laughs> uh, for inviting me to this uh, very important topic of uh, ART uh, regulation. Uh, and uh, in this particular presentation, I would be more focusing on the level one, uh, especially for the gynecologist. And uh, the views expressed in these uh, this presentation are of my own. And let us actually try to understand what are the questions that the gynecologists have in their mind, how the practice uh, have changed before the law and how it is different after the law has come into place. Um, so the first thing is, you know, what type of fertility patients, uh, you know, a gynecologist can see without the ART registration. That is a very basic question, which I hear, you know, gynecologists asking whenever I give uh, this lecture on ART. Uh, can semen sample be washed in the pathology labs, uh, you know, or in some other ART level one labs? And can we use that particular semen sample for our patient in case if we don't have the facility available in our center? If a patient wants to use a relative sample, how to go about it? Can a same semen sample be used multiple times in an IUI cycle on the same patient? And how do we register and what are the data reporting norms, you know, uh, in ART when it comes to a level one center? So broadly, uh, these are the main question that, you know, comes to the mind. And obviously, there are a lot of other questions which I'll try to cover, uh, you know, in this presentation of mine. Uh, so first, let us look at what is the differentiation of a level one versus a level two clinic. So a level one clinic is where only intrauterine insemination procedure is carried out as a part of treatment. So any of the gynecologists who's doing an IUI procedure needs to have a level one uh, license certificate uh, for their particular clinic. Level two obviously takes care of uh, the IVF part of it, uh, which I will probably skip in this presentation. Uh, let's say if you're going for a level one clinic, what is the minimum requirement as per the law? So for staff, you need minimum one gynecologist who shall be a postgraduate in gynecology and obstetrics. Uh, equipment wise, you need microscope, centrifuge and refrigerator. Um, so when the law came into place, there were a lot of clinics which were existing and a lot of clinics might be opening new, you know, after the law came into place. So for establishing a new clinic, as per the law, what it says is that no person shall establish any clinic or bank for undertaking ART or to render ART procedures in any form unless such clinic or bank is duly registered under the Act. Right. So all the clinics opening after the Act has to follow this 
principle and for the clinics which were opened before the law there was some delay in terms of different states taking their own time uh, to form the state authority and the state board and then do the registration or inspection of the clinics and issue them the certificate of registration so for clinics which were existing before the law this particular clause applies that every clinic or bank which is conducting art partly or exclusively shall within a period of 60 days from the date of establishment of the national registry apply for registration and this date of uh, establishment of national registry has been extended twice provided that such clinics or banks shall cease to conduct any such counseling or procedures on the expiry of six months from the date of commencement of the act unless such clinics or banks have applied for registration and is so registered separately or till such application is disposed of whichever is earlier so people who have already applied but their applications are pending with the state authority or the state board and they have not been rejected they can function normally the way they have been doing it before the law but they need to follow all the aspects of the law the registration certificate is, uh, uh, applying a registration is very simple you go to registry.artsurrogacy.gov.in there are three different types of application one is uh, for the art clinic second is for the art bank and third is for the surrogacy clinic when you click on the art clinic uh, you will be taken to this particular uh, form which is the form number one you fill in the relevant information if you see on the right hand side the point number seven eight nine you fill in what kind of procedure you are doing the same form is there for level one clinic also in the level two clinic so be careful in what you select in your 789 accordingly it will determine which particular uh, type of level clinic you are applying for uh, whether you are the director or not again it has to be declared because all the responsibility lies on the director which i'll cover when once we go into the penalty uh, you know slide towards the end and you have to declare uh, whatever is required uh, as per this particular form once you submit this application you take a copy of this application and submit it to the state authority or the district or the city authority most of the places it is the pcp entity authority who is taking care of the art but some of the states it is slightly different for registering your clinic as level one you will have to pay a sum of fifty thousand uh this will be valid for a period of five years then after a period of five years you will again have to pay the fee and renew your registration and go through the entire process make sure that once your state authority comes for inspection you have the degrees and the registration of all the staff members which you have declared in form number one and also the equipment list and the invoices are kept into that same file they may ask uh, the qualification certificate equipment bills you know draft consent forms all these consent forms are available uh, in the art uh, notifications which came in june right based on your application and based on the inspection they can grant the application or they may find out some defects which they will give you time uh, to tackle it uh, and if they reject your application you will be given an opportunity of hearing this is a website which is artsurrogacy.gov.in all the latest notifications which come all the different um, uh, act uh, the regulations you can find it on this particular website this is updated you can even find your appropriate authorities uh, who are the members of the appropriate authorities of the different state everything is there when it comes to art and surrogacy act now let us look at what is the definition of uh, ART. So it means that all technology that attempt to obtain a pregnancy by handling of sperm or oocyte of outside the human body and transferring of the gamete or embryo into the reproductive system of a woman is termed as ART, right? A commissioning couple is an infertile married couple who approaches a ART clinic or a ART bank for obtaining the services. A woman means uh, a single woman who is above the age of 21 years who approach the clinic for the treatment these are the basic definitions which are defined in the art act 
now let us look at some of the aspect when it comes to counseling and con consents uh, for the art so as per the 21c you will have to provide professional counseling and you will have to uh, counsel them on the implication and the chances of success of ART treatment, be it IUI or be it IVF. You have to inform advantages, disadvantages, cost, side effects, risk for arriving at an informed decision. You have to provide uh, awareness on the rights of child born through ART. Uh, you cannot perform any procedures without the written consent of all the parties seeking a reproductive technology. So let's say if you're doing IUI with a donor semen sample, you will have to have uh, consent of all the parties being involved, right? And the consent can be withdrawn anytime before the gamete transfer, right? For a level one clinic, you will mainly be concerned about the form, which is the form number seven, form, form number eight, form number 10, and form number 11. I will go through these forms uh, very quickly in, in the next slides. Uh, and I can uh, let you know that which form has to be used for what. So when it comes to form number uh, seven, this is a form which you use for uh, IUI uh, treatment. It's written here. Uh, and this has to be used uh, when you're using husband semen uh, or sperm, right? If you're using a donor semen or donor sperm for uh, IUI, you will have to use form number eight. And if you see the bottom, uh, what is written is that an appropriate modification in this form may be used for a artificial insemination of a single woman with donor semen. So if you're using a single, a single female going for a donor uh, semen IUI, you can appropriately modify this form accordingly. There is form number 10, uh, which says uh, consent of freezing gamete sperm oocyte. So if you have any uh, sperm to be frozen uh, for a patient uh, you can use this particular form right and again um, um, there are three different uh, you know aspects in case of a death what has to be done again this has to be ticked by the patient and it has to be signed by both husband and wife um, if there is a single woman uh, you can modify it accordingly uh, based on this uh, there are these point number one, two, and three, which you should read through, uh, basically saying that the renewal of these uh, cryopreserved semen uh, has to, I mean, the patient has to follow these instructions. And if the patient does not follow these instructions, the clinic have the right to discard it, right? So you should go through the point number one, two, and three, and then make a system process accordingly within your setup so that you inform the patient well within time uh, by using all the different methods mentioned in these consent forms. Uh, and even if the, and even after that, the patient does not comply or does not respond, you can discard the cryopreserved semen. This is uh, consent form number 11. This is mainly used for minors. So one thing that the law has changed is posthumous collection is now not possible unless you have the consent form of that particular uh, person who has faced some accident or something, right? Uh, this is a parental consent. Uh, so if there is any minor who wants to do a freezing because of the onco treatment, you can use form number 11 to freeze their uh, sperm or oocyte. Again, this form has the same point number one, two, and three. Uh, they will have to renew um, and, and give you the charges for freezing year on year. And if they don't give you, even after you follow these instructions, you have the right to discard it. Now, let us look at who can avail, uh, you know, this treatment, uh, the ART treatment. So the age criteria is very clearly defined in the act. The female age has, has to be between 21 to 50. The male has to be between 21 to 55. This is defined. Uh, you, you should only entertain patients who fall under this age. If a patient is going above this age, you as a clinic should ask them or should not cater to them because this is against the act, right? Whoever patient is coming to your clinic, you should maintain a age proof, though it is not written in the law, but it is better that you, you know, have some, some ID preserved with you, which kind of tells about their age. When it comes to donor sperm, uh, 
there are registered banks now so this is one thing that has come after this act came into play that there is something which is called the art bank so you will have to source the donors from the art bank uh, you cannot mix samples anymore you cannot mix semen of two different uh, people and treat a female uh, using that uh, mix, mix semen uh, you have to make sure that the storage of these semen samples are securely done in a segregated area there is a recording and identification process that exists at your clinic if an inspection is happen if an inspection happens at your clinic you should be able to demonstrate that you have securely uh, uh, preserved these samples and there is a proper recording and identification which is available in your record uh, all the unused gametes shall be used on the same commissioning couple the one thing that has changed after the law is that one donor has to go to one recipient only you cannot share it to multiple recipient this is not allowed one semen sample or one oocyte sample will have to be used by only one commissioning couple or a single female it cannot be used or shared between multiple people the sale or transfer of gamete or zygote is strictly prohibited and it is a punishable offense it should not be done if a couple needs to move their semen or oocyte or embryo from one clinic to other clinic they will have to follow a process of application to the national board there are three affidavits which has to be filled in and sent to the national board and then the national board will approve any movement of the gametes which can happen in the country this process normally takes around 3 to 5 months to execute so if you are telling it to your patients let them know a realistic time of how much time it will take for the movement uh, application to uh, be approved uh for males the age limit for donation is 21 years to 55 years so a male can donate semen between the age group of 21 to 55 uh what is the information that you need to keep and maintain first thing is the confidentiality of uh, the couple is very important so when i say confidentiality it means the uh, let's say if you're sourcing a semen from a bank so there are there are four parties involved one is the uh uh semen donor second is the art bank third is the couple or a single woman and fourth is the art clinic so because of these uh, uh because of certain aspect there might be a identity which might be revealed during this process but what you have to make sure that within the four parties it is kept confidential and it should not go outside of the four party this is what the confidentiality term means once the national registry is uh, made you will have to disclose certain information uh, recently there was a notification sent from the central government to all the state governments to collect the data in a particular format and send it back to the central government so this process is slowly starting lot of states have made their own format where they are sending it to the clinics and similar to the pcpndt they are asking the clinics to submit the details and the data before the 5th of february month so you need to get in touch with your state authority and once the national registry is established you will have to do a online uh, filling also similar to how we do it in the pcpndt portal you will have to issue a discharge summary with details of the procedure performed to all the couples who are undergoing a art procedure uh, the record keeping is now Uh, for a period of 10 years you have to maintain all the records for a period of 10 years if a clinic is shutting down before the period of 10 years you will have to make sure that you transfer all these details to the national registry and if there is a co court case going against you you will have to preserve all these record till the court case is disposed of which may be even more than 10 years there is now a requirement of grievance handling uh, cell for the patient uh though there is not too much detail about who should be a part of this grievance handling cell in the art act but you can frame a committee which may comprise of two to three members in your setup uh, the patient the relative or even an anonymous person can use this form number 5 to do a grievance uh, in your center uh please keep this form number 5 printed at your reception and also put a board in the reception area that who constitute a part of this grievance handling cell uh, and an email id and a phone number in case if people want to send an email or call and update and then 
this form has to be uh, um, uh, uh, you know discussed between the grievance committee which is formed at your center and whatever comes out of this grievance committee has to be informed uh, to the patient and this has to you know frame as a part of a record uh, and you will have to uh, or you will be required to submit it to the state authority as and when asked let us come to offenses and penalty uh, so let me just go through that what according to act is is punishable so any medical geneticist gynecologist or rmp or any person shall not abandon disown or exploit or cause to abandon disown or exploit in any form the child or children born through art sell human gametes run an agency a racket or an organization for selling purchasing or trading of human gametes import or help in getting imported in whatso manner human gametes exploit the commissioning couple woman or gamete donor in any form sell any human gamete for the purpose of research and if you are found doing any of these there is a first fine of 5 to 10 lakhs for the first contravention that you do if it is subsequently repeated then it may result into 3 to 8 years of imprisonment with 10 to 25 lakhs of fine Uh, who shall be liable to be punished it is the executive head of the clinic right so be very careful um, uh, though there may be a mistake done by the staff but eventually you being the executive head of the clinic uh, your line is in the fire and you will be responsible for any of these contravention uh, that may happen at your clinic uh, and uh, in case while the court feels that there is any other officer who is additionally involved or responsible along with the executive head then even he is uh, and and if he is found guilty uh, even he is liable for uh, punishment and penalty so um, as per the clause 34 of the act uh, anything that contains in the act any contravention that happen uh, with any of the clauses of the act the punishment is the same so be very careful uh, you know in terms of how you handle uh, and your staff is properly trained there is a sop in place where the staff follow the sop and the checklist so you make sure that whatever knowledge that you have gained uh, by reading the law or by uh, interpreting the different clauses of the law is put as a black and white in terms of sop and checklist so that the staff blindly follows the sop and the checklist indirectly they are following the act and that is the only way you can make sure that uh, your position is secure with this i come to the end of my presentation if there is any questions uh, on it i will be happy to take it thank you very much हेलो सो इट वॉज अ वेरी इलेबोरेटेड टॉक बाय डॉक्टर नितेश followed by uh, whatever we wanted to know do, uh, both our speakers they did full justice to uh, make us understand the law now i i take proud privilege in introducing uh, my panelists who are going to ask questions as well as replying to He'll, they'll be asking questions from our experts and they'll also take the questions from the public whatever are there so uh, my first our first panelist is dr sureta kareem she is managing director star hospital private limited gorakhpur director at safal test tube baby center gorakhpur ma'am is life member of iag foxy ims president of indian menopause society gorakhpur ma'am is also an ex president of gox and inner wheel club gorakhpur and uh, she has organized first live workshop on ndvh and uh, on laparoscopy and hysteroscopy at upcog gorakhpur in 2003 ma'am is trained in art and ivf and in laparoscopic 
and hysteroscopic surgery from Frankfurt, Germany. She is regularly organizing hands-on training in laparoscopy and art for ART for young gynecologists. Certif Ma'am is certified by IIM Indore in Krit I am not able to pronounce Krita. I think it's a leadership Kritanjana. program for Kritanjana. Kritanjana. Okay, Kritanjana. Okay, okay. Kritanjana. Fine. Leadership program for frontline doctors. And ma'am, really participating as faculty in many in national and international conferences of ART and laparoscopy. She has achieved Wonder Fox Award 2019, Nari Shakti Samman by UP government in 2020, certification of appreciation by IIMA for outstanding work in COVID times in 2021. Ma'am is contested as that's what I wanted to tell. Apart from being an academician, Par excellence, ma'am is a wonderful leader. She is contested for the as a candidate in mayor election in 2012 and as a candidate candidate for member parliament in polls in 2018. Uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Our second panelist is a dear, just like sister, friend, whatever, junior, Dr. Ekika Singh, my neighbor too. She is Managing Director and Consultant, Sharda Narayan Hospital, President Mahu Society Executive Member, ISAR UP State Chapter. Dr. Ekika has so many awards and accolades to her credit, like Champion of ESA 2020, Wonder Foxen Award by Foxy 2019, Foxy Unsung Hero Award 2018, Best Paper Presentation Award UPCOG 2018, Best Paper Presentation Award UISA 2019, Shakti Yodha Award by Mission Shakti, and the Best Doctor Award by Lion Club International. Dr. Ekika has multiple publications to her credit, like Role of Progestin Prime Ovarian Stimulation in IVF XC Protocols, Evaluation of high basal LH on IVF XE outcomes in PPOS protocol cycles, role of platelet rich plasma and thin endometrium, evaluation of combination therapy, inositols, antioxidants, and vitamins in PCOS. I welcome Dr. Akika. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sita, for a uh, uh, kind introduction. And uh, first and foremost, I really want to thank both the speakers. Dr. Anupma, you were, I mean, uh, I heard you for the first time and you made it so simple for everyone to understand. And Nitej, I know, of course, I think, I mean, he's being called so many times for this thing that everything is now, I mean, it's it's just like sp saying anything, okay, Ab ye batana hai. so he knows everything in point, he doesn't even have to look back. I think, Nitej, uh, probably by now, you must have got thousands and thousands of questions to answer. So, uh, probably first and foremost, I want to ask Nitish this thing to you. Like in UP, there is no uh, state council which is being made till yet. So, anybody who is wanting to register now, I mean, the act was maybe a year back and they want to go and, you know, register now so they can still go and register on the website for ART2 or ART1 clinic. Yeah, they can, of course. They can. And do they need to wait or they can really start? Hi, Nitesh. Hi. He is traveling. That was uh, uh, okay. So, Excellent yeah. talk, huh? Yeah. It Thank looks you. like like you are really speaking. We literally thought that you are already in the room. I said, oh, you are here. <laughs> I thought. Uh, was... There was on and off signal going up and down. But Ram anyway, of me, good. I thought you were speaking and I was seeing, I was looking at the video playing. Right. So, I mean, uh, if anybody now, uh, they go and register for the ART2 and ART1, which is now they do now. I mean, maybe in this month or next month. So, once they put up their application there, they can start practicing. They don't need to wait for anything. Um, slightly gray area. Um, ideally, you know, as for the act, uh, you know, clinics who have been operating before the act came into picture, if they have applied, and their application is not rejected in 30 days, they can continue to work. Okay. But obviously for newer center, as for the act, they require to have, uh, you know, a certificate of registration before they operate. But 
considering that uh, you know up um, i think uh, no, uh, things have not progressed yes, and they have not issued any registration mm -hmm. um again it's a, it's a you know gray area uh, you know in terms of what is the right answer for that but i think uh, the right uh, thing to do is to get in touch with the local authority uh, of course the center should do the application should do their part in terms of uh, you know applying for the registration and then have a discussion with the local state authority and do as per their instructions okay so probably anybody i mean this is for everyone who is uh, in those states where the authority is not being formed if they were not doing this practice before so they really have to you know get in touch with the local authorities inform them fill their form and then decide what is to be done in consensus with the local authorities that is True. what the, the, you're saying so um one more thing which i really wanted to ask you if there is you are already having one art2 clinic and now you want to put up one art1 clinic i mean you are trying to do an opd somewhere besides your own center so for that opd they need a proper registration again or a doctor who has their own art2 clinic can do opd anywhere no besides i mean their own center. Uh, if, if see if you're doing a, a procedure at that level 1 clinic it has to be treated as a separate clinic and a proper okay. registration with all the documentation in terms of manpower and equipment has to be present at the center and you will have to apply for a registration so if procedure means you means uh, iui or the stimulation also comes in procedure yeah the iui procedures for and level 1 they are doing just the stimulations and just the uh, plain opd and maybe stimulating the patient there by giving gonadotropin injections See, the I I'll I'll treat it in a different way. I'll not uh, treat it that you're doing it at the center. How I will treat it is that let's say you are at a level two center and okay. you have given a prescription to the patient for a level two center, which you are uh, able to give for any IVF patient. But uh, let's say you are doing a consultation somewhere or a patient is going to a third center to do a follicular monitoring and you know putting the drug or a uh they cannot be stopped right because it's patient right to administer or buy a drug from you know their uh, center or shop of their choice right so consider it in that way rather than okay. you going to another center and doing something it is the patient choice to go to a oh. center and you know administer the drug so drug and in terms of the procedure right yeah, yeah. okay that's the patient choice but in terms of the procedure which is io or ivf Mm -hmm. it has to happen at a registered clinic only okay okay um, and then i had one more question uh, that is can i ask one more question when I, uh, dr ekika has finished yeah sure yeah, yeah please okay and uh, somebody is asking suppose uh, a couple who is not an of indian origin a foreigner couple suppose an african wants to come to our clinic for self or od cycle what are the rules so the foreigners are not restricted when it comes to the art treatment they can freely undergo the only criteria that they need to follow is the age uh, when it comes to donor uh, a foreign donor is not allowed in india because if you see the donor consent form it has the aadhar number uh, which has to be mentioned in the consent forms and hence if a foreign patient wants to undergo art treatment in india with a donor they can use the indian donor uh, and do the same can they use indian donor i mean uh, even if they are not of indian origin yes uh, they can commissioning couple yeah okay thank yes. you but that has to be informed to the local authorities that you are doing a treatment for foreign uh, based nationally so uh, any NIH. foreign any foreigner who is undergoing a treatment they... has to be on a medical visa okay uh, yeah, that I'm takes care about. of that part that they are undergoing a medical treatment in india besides that if they have taken a, a medical visa and they come to your clinic do you need to inform the local uh, police authority also that there is a foreign person who is undergoing a treatment so there is no uh, regulation in the art or the surrogacy act where you have to inform this thing to the official but if mm -hmm. you go to the ministry of external affairs website mm -hmm. there are few uh, 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 you know patients from a particular nation where you will okay. have to update the authority especially if a patient is from pakistan and okay. bangladesh 
there is a, a, a time limit that you will have to keep updating the Ministry of External Affairs or the local police station. I mean, if they're, they're staying for a prolonged period, that is one really you need to inform the local. It's not about the long period. It is about the nationality. And there are, you know, conditions which are there in the Ministry of External Affairs. You will have to keep, uh, you know, the local police station informed about them. Okay. And uh, uh, one thing uh, you and Dr. Anupma both mentioned about the Form 5, five that is a grievance form. So, in that you mentioned two or three people. I mean, they can be anybody from the hospital or there is a particular, I mean, uh, their, um, uh, what, uh, uh, they have to be the doctors or the direct, matter anything designation is being given to them? So, the law does not say anything about who can be a part of a grievance committee. Anyone okay. can be a part. See, the whole idea of putting a grievance committee is uh, couples directly approaching to the state authority or to the court. Uh, there is a new provision in the act where they are putting a grievance uh, to you and you have the chance to sort it out and solve it before the couple goes to appropriate authority or to a court. If a couple directly goes to appropriate authority, you can tell them that they haven't followed the procedure as per the act, which is they haven't put a grievance report in my clinic for me to solve it out uh, and they have directly approached to the appropriate authority for the same. So this is put just to you know, uh, reduce the number of queries going to the appropriate authority if it can be solved at the local level by the clinic. Uh, basically, you know, uh, can I add, Ikka? Basically, yeah, sure. if you uh, see the NABH uh, protocols, they also specify the same thing. They also yeah. need to have a, we need to have a grievance. Yeah. Grievance cell. Yeah. So yeah. that That's grievance cell is the same as this. So if yeah. any hospital who's accredited with NABH, they yeah. also yeah. Know have that. It's just nothing big. You just have to have two members, maybe three. If it's a big setup, maybe a three-member division. You can have any senior nurse in your uh, uh, hospital, any administrative post person, uh, senior doctor, the two or three who uh, need to uh, handle this. So that cell, if it is made, then you are secure and uh, they are supposed to address to it. And whenever the patient is going directly to appropriate authorities, you can always uh, give the answer of how they have handled it. So that is the purpose of it. Ikika, you are muted. Uh, one one uh, scenario I want to ask. I mean, uh, there is a couple and husband is fuzzy. They He frees his sample. For the IUI, he's a 4G. And since because he cannot come and down again and again, this is what happened in my clinic. That's my masking. Everything was fine. They wanted to go for an IUI. And he uh, he freezed his sample. I mean, he did one IUI, which was a failure. Then he freezed the sample and went off. And later on the border or whatever, he died. And his sample is frozen with me. So can that sample be used for the woman for IUI? If he has... Uh... Yeah, if you see the consent form, uh, there are three options which are written. In case of my death, what will happen okay. to my sample? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as per the you know declaration done by the couple in the consent form, you can use mm -hmm. the sample accordingly, which is perish, it belongs to my wife, or donate for research. Oh, okay. So, I mean, uh, I think probably uh, the things were presented so nicely by you and Dr. Anupama that... Uh, most of the things are clear. There were a few gray zones, which I really wanted to ask specifically about the OPD, if they are doing OPD at two other, three other places. So until and unless they are not doing any procedure, it can be taken as an OPD clinic for them and there is no problem. But uh, the moment they put up in a, a procedure, any of the uh, maybe IUI over there, so they have to get that clinic separately registered as ART clinic one. So... I mean, that is all. Dr. Seema, I mean, do you have anything else to uh, ask? And do we have any more questions? Yeah, I don't have any question. Uh, and I was asking Suchira if there are any more questions in uh, the box, they should be telling us. No, ma'am. There are no okay. questions. So it, uh, it has been a wonderful uh, series. Your second part or episode 2 of art act in association with isar science integra and bsv 
Thank you, Science Integra and BSV for providing us this platform. And thank you, ESAR, for endorsing it. And I would like to thank my excellent speakers, Dr. Anupma Fatela and Dr. Nitish Murdia, for such an elaborative and uh, insightful session, uh, followed by question answers by our expert panelist, Dr. Ekika Singh. I don't think there is anything left for our viewers. There is it anything more to understand for See, me. But there too. aren't any viewers. There, there are nine of us there. No, no, this is, no, faculty, no, this is not the this is faculty link. This That's is faculty link. No okay. viewers. It's not like this is for us only. Okay. And uh, sorry for me, my level of understanding is that much as much it is in during question answers. Just I keep forgetting so you can imagine how important it is to understand it thoroughly and for people like me they'll have to keep listening and repeating this webinar so thank you uh, there are 600 660 plus 660 live viewers, viewers. thank you viewers because of you your enthusiasm we are able to uh, just organize and hold these sessions and uh, um, at the outset I would like to thank our president ESAR Dr. Amit Patki for giving his endorsement and Dr. Asha Bakshi our secretary to make it the first official webinar in this new tenure and I think we did a good and decent job and uh, as we can look at the audience and we promise you that we'll keep doing it. First was with Gujarat. This was with Uttar Pradesh. Since Uttar Pradesh ART board has not been formed, so I requested my dear friend, Dr. Anupma, who is an appropriate authority in Uttarakhand board to come and enlighten us. With, with this, I would like to thank our partners, Science Integra, especially thank you, Subhu and Suchira, for making giving us free hand to involve our friends and expert faculty. Thank you, BSV, for providing this platform. And thank you, Dr. Nitis, once again, and Dr. Anupma, Dr. Ekika, Dr. Sureta, and thank you, Suchira and Aparna for coordinating it so wonderfully that everything got very smooth. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all the doctors.